Hey everybody, my name is Nicole Christensen and this is The Crime Happens Here. Today we're going to be talking about Hannah Graham. On September 13, 2014, a Virginia college student named Hannah Graham didn't return home after going to a party. This worried her roommate, so they contacted the police and reported her missing. Unfortunately, during her journey from one party to the other, she encountered a horrible individual, leading to her mysterious disappearance. It was found out later that she came in contact with somebody named Jesse Leroy Matthew Jr., her, who ultimately caused her fatal harm through what they believed to be strangulation. Despite extensive efforts to find her in the city over several weeks, Hannah's remains were only discovered five weeks later. The investigation also revealed that Jesse Leroy Matthew Jr was involved in a series of similar offenses, classifying him as a serial offender. So Hannah Graham was born on February 25th, 1996 in Reading, Berkshire, England. She moved to the United States in order to obtain an American education from the University of Virginia. She was hoping to get her degree in global public health and at the time of her disappearance, she was in her second year of school. Those who knew Hannah described her as somebody who wholeheartedly embraced her life in the United States. She loved it. She was known for her infectious enthusiasm and people admired her positive and joyful personality. During her time in college, she actively participated in a, very, in a variety of extracurricular activities, thoroughly enjoying her academic journey. Friends and family praised her for her intelligence, friendly nature, and unwavering loyalty to her friends and family without any biases. Hannah's empathetic spirit was evident in her active involvement in charitable en endeavors, especially her contribution to the post-tornado rebuilding efforts in Tuscaloosa, Alabama with Habitat for Humanity. Her interests were diverse, including a passion for learning French and immersing herself in the French culture, which led, which led to a summer studying in France. Hannah was just into a lot of different things. She was good at music, and she was playing piano, and she was actually picking up the alto saxophone. She even took charge in leading her old high school's marching band at West Potomac High School. Besides her musical side, she was also into sports like softball and ski racing, showing she had a well-rounded and dynamic personality. Let's go to September 13th, 2014. Hannah was just 18 years old when she went missing. Surveillance videos quickly pointed the police in the right direction to Matthews, but there were still a lot of an unanswered questions. Okay. So around 1.20 a.m., Hannah texted her friend saying she had left one party and she was heading to another. She really wanted to go to the second party but admitted she was lost and she couldn't find the place. So she ended up wandering around for a while and she really didn't know where she was going, but she ended up at Charlottesville Downtown Pedestrian Mall as the police later confirmed through surveillance footage. Both the video and the witness accounts showed that she entered the mall alone appearing visibly affected by alcohol, which was supported by footage, indicating she had recently been in a place serving drinks. Afterward, she left the mall on her own, marking a crucial moment in the timeline of that night. Later that evening, surveillance footage captured Hannah at the restaurant Tempo. During her time there, she encountered a man subsequently identified as Jesse Leroy Matthew Jr. Many observers noted an unsettling aura around him with several expressing a feeling that something was just wrong with him and the interaction. One witness distinctly recalled Matthew attempting to buy Hannah a drink and this witness told another witness he's going to F her up. So the general consensus among onlookers was that there was an undeniable sense of unease surrounding their interactions and just Matthew's whole demeanor, it was just yucky. Like people just did not like it. And people kind of knew that something bad was gonna happen, but no one really said anything so they didn't wanna be like dramatic. So witnesses say that Hannah appeared really drunk even before having drinks at the bar. And Matthew was last seen with his arm around her, leading her outside of the building. 
As they were leaving, they approached his car, which was an orange 1998 Chrysler Sebring. One witness said that Hannah told Matthew, I am not getting into that car with you. Afterwards, things get a bit unclear. Hannah ended up in the car, and it's not clear how she got there, whether she was coerced or forcibly taken. Unfortunately, there was no communication or trace of her after that. A witness remembered hearing Hannah express reluctance to get into the car, but what happened next, we don't know. What was weird is that surveillance footage showed Matthew driving away alone, but the discovery of Hannah's DNA in the vehicle confirmed that she was in some way in that vehicle, leaving the details of how she ended up in the car a complete mystery. Okay, so let's talk about Matthew's journey that evening. On that evening, Matthew was trying to connect with somebody special, making several attempts to engage with women at different bars throughout the night. He first went to the Lazy Parrot Bar where he approached a woman who was by herself. Despite her clear disinterest and telling him she had a boyfriend, Matthew kept making advances, complimenting her lips and touching her repeatedly. He even tried to get her phone number, but she firmly declined. Realizing his efforts weren't going anywhere at the Lazy Parrot, he eventually decided to leave. Between 11.30 and 11.45, he approached two women at another bar called the blue light. He started picking them up by cradling them underneath their buttocks, is what one witness said. The women felt incredibly uncomfortable, so they actually decided to leave the blue light and go to another bar and they would end up at another bar with him later that evening. But anyways, at the blue light, he even approached another girl. The woman took off her boots because her feet were kind of hurting her, and he proceeded to take off one of her socks and touch her foot. Despite her repeatedly telling him no, he didn't stop. He said something like, a woman that takes care of her feet takes care of everything else. The whole situation made her extremely uncomfortable. She told investigators that even after she firmly said no, he looked at her in a crazy way. This experience stuck with her, and when investigators interviewed her about Matthew, she was able to recall the night very well. So after the blue light, Matthew went to the bar Rapture. At Rapture, he grabbed a woman's bottom and then tried to do it again. Of course, this was not reciprocated by the woman, and she was uncomfortable about his gesture. He realized that no women were going to go home with him, and so once again, he left the bar trying to find something else. As he was approaching Tempo, he saw a woman, which was Hannah. She was walking unsteadily down the street. He was probably thinking this was the perfect victim, a beautiful young woman who was incredibly vulnerable. She was obviously intoxicated and she was walking alone. He caught up to her and put his arm around her. One of the witnesses who saw this happen said, you don't even know her. And then Matthew responded by saying, hush. If only the witnesses had sensed something more sinister was about to take place, then they could have intervened. That is when Hannah and Matthew went into the bar at Tempo. And that's when the witnesses noticed that he was trying to buy her drinks even though she was already really intoxicated. And that's when one witness told the other witness that he was going to F her up. They left the bar and that's when they walked to his car and we don't know what happened next. Once Hannah didn't return home, police were notified that she was missing and investigators immediately sprung into action. Quickly into the investigation, the police were able to see the surveillance footage and receive information from eyewitnesses that indicated Matthew was the last person to see Hannah alive. So news broke out that police were looking for him. Everybody in Virginia had their eyes peeled for him. When they found Matthew, they were able to find DNA on Matthew's shorts that likely belonged to Hannah. And then they found similar DNA on the interior passenger side door of the car. Witnesses also say that they saw his vehicle between 6.30 and 7.30 that morning near a rural vacant property, which was the same property where Hannah's skeletonized remains would be later found. Matthew then tried to ditch town. On September 20th, a search party was orchestrated to help look for her body, but nothing was found. On September 24th, 2014, Matthew was caught again during the whole thing, Matthew didn't really cooperate much with the ongoing investigation. He didn't give much information. When the officers asked about Hannah being in his car, all he could muster was a hesitant, um, response. 
His uncooperative attitude raised even more suspicions about his role in the disappearance of Hannah. Hannah's body would be found five weeks after her disappearance. When she was found, she was wearing the crop top and jeans that she was last seen in. However, they were both inside out and her pants were unzipped. Her jeans also had holes in them that were not there when she had left home. Her undergarments, shoes, and cell phone were never recovered. Police officers were never able to get Matthew to tell them where he placed her belongings. She didn't appear to have suffered any type of blunt force trauma, so it was determined that she was likely murdered by suffocation or strangulation. Police officers are unsure if she was strangled in the back of his vehicle or if he took her to another location to murder her. Matthew was arrested and faced charges of murder in connection with Hannah's tragic death. Unexpectedly, more charges were brought against him, including the murder of another woman and a rape case. Surprisingly, he chose to plead guilty to these serious offenses. As a result of his admission, he received four life sentences. The revelation of his criminal history highlighted his status as a serial offender. Thankfully, law enforcement intervened in time, putting an end to his spree and ensuring that justice was served preventing potential future victims. Hannah's family is trying to keep her memory alive. They think about her and all the small things that made her who she was. They miss her smile, her love for life, her optimism, her quick wit, her cooking, texting with her, and chatting on the phone. Because of Matthew, they will never be able to make any more memories with Hannah. Hannah's family said that she was a great force of nature and that she never half-heartedly took on things. She would fully immerse herself in everything that she would take on. The family decided to set up multiple things to keep Hannah alive. They set up the Hannah Graham Memorial Award, providing UVA students with educational opportunities. They set up the Alternative Spring Break Fund, which provides scholarship to ASB participants working for Habitat for Humanity. The family organizes the Hannah Graham Memorial Softball Tournament, raising money for charities and increasing awareness to help protect children from predators. They also set up research that is supported by the World Bank to identify measures to address violence against women and girls. Her family said, many people who knew Hannah said that she would change the world. She did, though not in the way anybody expected. Hannah enabled law enforcement to apprehend a serial rapist and murderer who had been hiding in plain sight in Charlottesville for years, and for that, she is a heroine. This one really hurt, as do all the cases, but this one just broke my heart because Hannah was so young and she had so much life in front of her. I'm grateful for the police that they were able to apprehend him quickly and get him off the streets. So sorry for Hannah's family that they had to endure such a horrific event. Well, that's it for me, you guys. Thanks for watching The Crime Happens Here. I'll see you next time. Bye.